Let's come and pray as we seek God's word today. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your living word. We thank you that it is a sword that pierces deep into our heart. A sword that brings both conviction of sin and the comfort of the gospel. Father, we pray that you would convict us of our error today, but that you would also heal us with that great gospel balm. Help us to hope in you alone. And may we have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. So we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Today, many cities are easily recognised by their skylines and their distinctive architecture. The Sydney Opera House is distinctive of Sydney, obviously. San Francisco is easily picked out by the Golden Gate Bridge. And London is easily identified from Big Ben and the Palace of Westminster. Pergamon was a little bit like that, a major city in Asia Minor. It was famous all over the region for its distinctive skyline and architecture. It would have made it really easily to identify. You could have looked at it and said, that's definitely Pergamon. Although those pictures that you see at the minute wouldn't make it very distinctive from much else. But in its day, it was a place of real architectural beauty and distinctive buildings. Those famous buildings were all mostly temples and shrines to various pagan gods and places where idols were worshipped. In addition to those temples to many pagan gods, the worship of the emperor, the worship of Caesar was particularly strong in Pergamon. It was the seat of power for the Roman region. So worship in Caesar was at the core of life in Pergamon. Across the Roman world, Caesar was to be worshipped. We heard last week about how Polycarp was put to death for his refusal to confess that Caesar was Lord. And in Pergamon, there was a a temple specifically dedicated to the purpose of worshipping the Caesar, the Roman emperor. One commentator suggests that by the time John is writing this letter, there was no city in Asia in which the worship of Caesar was stronger. And therefore, no place where Christians were more immediate danger for refusing to sacrifice to the emperor and to confess that Caesar is Lord. All of this, the many pagan temples, the seat of Roman power, the temple to the worship of Caesar, gives us some indication into why Jesus might refer to this city as the place where Satan lives. The place where Satan has his throne. It was seen as a place where there were many false gods, many people set against the one true God. Jesus is keen to highlight the evil that exists in this place. It was a place where it clearly was not easy to be a Christian, where Jesus was not honoured above all, where Caesar was seen to be Lord, not Jesus. And so the church is commanded here for holding fast to Jesus' name and not renouncing their faith, even though when one of their members, Antipas, had actually been killed for his faith. The church still held on. They remained true to the teaching of Jesus. They endured persecution and they remained faithful, much like we saw last week with the church in Smyrna. And Jesus commends them for that. They kept going, even though the rest of the culture was swimming against them. But sadly, John goes on to say that not everyone has remained faithful in Pergamon. Some now hold to the teaching of Balaam and the Nicolaitans. There's a lot of discussion around what this false teaching might be, but commentators agree that whatever the teaching is, that the teaching of the Nicolaitans and the Balaamites was likely the same error. It was a false teaching set in some way against the true gospel of Jesus. It's most likely with the reference to Balaam that John is referring back to an incident that happened in the Old Testament in Numbers 25 when God's people were wandering through the wilderness. Balaam was a false prophet sent by a pagan king, Balak, to curse God's people. But every time that Balaam went to curse God's people, every time he opened his mouth to pronounce a curse on them, God made blessing come out. He tries many times to curse God's people, but every time he opens his mouth, blessing comes out. Eventually, Balaam gives up. He says, I can't curse these people. But he he goes back to the king and he he says, I can't curse these people. But he makes a suggestion that the king tries a softer, a less obvious approach. Don't curse God's people outright, he says. Instead of using witchcraft or military might, 
Balaam suggests that the king should simply try to seduce the Israelites, seduce them with Moabite women. And in Numbers 25, you can go and read it for yourself. We find out how this ploy is successful. God's people commit adultery, sexual adultery and spiritual adultery with God. They, they become like the people around them and do the things that the people around them are doing. They turn away from following the one true God and they worship idols. They take part in all kinds of pagan practices that God had forbidden. The false and the deceptive nature of the teachings of Balaam is a warning to us all. That very often evil and Satan and temptation do not come in the very obvious forms that we might expect it to. But actually often Satan acts as an agent of life, light. Like Paul says in 2 Corinthians 11. He comes as a false teacher to deceive the church. And while we don't know the details here of what's happening in Pergamon, it appears that it is deception that is at the core of it. It is the softer kind of leading astray that we see. Joe Beakey reminds us that the devil has many disguises. He doesn't always come as pure, outright evil in our face. Sometimes he will come as an angel of light to deceive us and lead us astray. We must be constantly on our guard. See, the call of God's people constantly throughout the scriptures was that they should be holy as he is holy. They were to be distinct and different from the people around them. We read in our call to worship, they were to be like salt. They were to stand out to live set apart lives. And while that is the repeated calling in God's people throughout scripture, one of the repeated sins that we often see over and over again is that God's people compromise this distinctiveness in order to fit in with the people around them. We see that in Numbers 25 and we see it here in Pergamon. Some of those in the church are compromising there, embracing this false teaching which is resulting in them feeling to be distinct, feeling to live the set apart lives that God has called them to, feeling to stand out for Jesus. Some commentators believe that the teaching of the Nicolaitans probably in some way validated a certain level of participation in wider civic life and the celebrations of the city in Pergamon. The Nicolaitans were saying, it's okay if you want to go to those feasts. It's okay if you want to go and eat that meat that has been sacrificed to idols. It's okay if you want to take part in that idolatry and that immorality. The Nicolaitans were really teaching the church to take a low view of sin. They were saying, that doesn't really matter. Don't worry about it. They were minimising the role of God's law and the role of God's word in their lives. And as a result of the church members listening to those Nicolaitans, they began to compromise with those around them, taking part in pagan festivals and rituals. And in doing so, they began embracing those pagan practices, those ideals and their morals. They became like the people around them. They were being shaped and influenced by the culture around them and so they were not acting like salt anymore. They were feeling to be salty, feeling to be distinct, feeling to be agents of change for Jesus in that city. We're not told exactly what caused those people to follow the Nicolaitans and the teachings of Balaam but maybe this compromise came about because some were afraid. They had seen their friend Antipas killed. So maybe they decided they would assimilate more in the hope of preserving their own lives. Maybe if we just go to this one feast, maybe if we just bow to this one idol, then we might save our lives. It's possible that some of the food sacrificed to idols that we read about in verse 14 refers to feasts that were had, held in honour of Caesar the emperor. Taking part of them, it's likely may have been a sign of social standing. So to be invited to these feasts was a sign that you were someone in society. It may even have been essential to take part in some of these meals in order to keep operating and trading and business in the city. So it's possible that this compromise was fueled by a desire to be liked and accepted. A desire to fit in with the wider culture and to be, to be thought well of in the wider court of public opinion. To fit in so that they can keep doing business with the right sorts of people. Maybe it was easier to go along with some things than to stand up for biblical distinctives. I'm sure we can all relate to that, can't we? It's not just teenagers who feel the pressure to give in to peer pressure in order to fit in and be liked. Even as adults, that temptation is very real. 
If we're honest, the temptation to compromise our faith is very real today. It's hard to always swim against the tide. And it's not nice always being the odd one out. Sometimes it's easier to withdraw from an awkward conversation or to stay silent in the office rather than to give a biblical viewpoint. Or rather than say, actually, I find that quite offensive. It was probably their desire to fit in that led these people to compromise and ultimately to worship idols and to embrace the morals and ethics of the culture around them. There's a a powerful warning here for us in this passage, I believe. We must take great care not to minimize sin, but always to see it as something serious, something that is to be resisted and eradicated from our lives, and never something that is to be embraced or played with. We must never take a low view of sin, but we must take great care to actively be on our guard against the compromise which subtly comes in, to compromise with the world around us. And yet this is a a difficult balance to get, a difficult path to navigate, where Jesus sends us into the world to witness. In the past, some have fallen into the air of total separation from the world around them in order to avoid a compromise with culture, they withdraw completely, they take nothing to do with anyone who's not part of the church. I don't think that's the best course of action. How can we witness to those around us if we're not in the world, so to speak? Take Jesus' famous illustration that we've referred to through our service today of salt. Salt cannot be effective unless it leaves the salt shaker. It must come into contact with the food if it is to bring the improvement and the benefit that it can. In short, we are called to be in the world but not off the world. But we need to be so careful that the the world around us does not begin to impact us more than we are impacting the world. It's a a tension we live with, a a balance that we seek to get right. For some in the church in Pergamon, they fail to get that balance right. They embrace the false teaching and with it the idolatry and the immorality of the culture around them. And because of this, Jesus brings them a warning in verse 16. A warning of judgment that's symbolised with references to the sword. He will come and remove the false teachers and those who follow them unless they repent. In the ancient world, the sword was a symbol of the authority given to the governor in a city. So whenever we are told that Jesus comes with a sword, we are presented with a very stark and clear image. Those in the church must determine whose authority is it they will live by. Will they submit to the cultural standards around them? Will they submit to the sword of the emperor? Or will they submit to God's word, the sword of God's word? Will they submit to the authority of God in their lives or submit to the authority of the emperor? That is the decision that is presented to them. It's a question that we all must wrestle with often as we seek to follow Jesus in the modern world. Whose authority will we live by? Will we live by the world's authority or the authority of God's word? This message of judgment also comes with a call to repentance. One writer observes that repent is a word of hope, telling us that no matter how far off course we have gone, there is still the opportunity to return to God. Repent is a word of hope, telling us that no matter how far off course we have gone, there is still the opportunity to repent and return to God. I'm sure we can all look back at times whenever we have caved to cultural pressure. Maybe ways we have caved to cultural pressure in big ways. Maybe times we have caved to cultural pressure in smaller ways that no one else really knows about. There are times when we fail to submit to the Bible's authority in our lives. Times even when we ignore it. The good news of the gospel is that even when we stumble and fall, if we repent and turn to God again, he is faithful and just to forgive us from all our sins, all our faults, all our feelings. I love Jack Miller's definition of repentance. He says repentance is an attitude beginning at conversion. Throughout the Christian life it is a drawing near to God of the whole person, a humbling of the heart expressed in daily response of obedience to the love and will of the Heavenly Father. It's painful but liberating. I love that definition because it reminds me that repentance isn't a one-off. It begins at conversion But it's a decision, it's not the decision of a moment, but it's a a daily reality. Throughout the Christian's life, it is a a daily turning to God in obedience and trust and faith. As I am daily challenged to conform to the culture around me, I must daily turn in faith and trust and repentance to God in loving obedience. But I love this this definition as well, because it also reminds me that repentance isn't always easy. 
Often it's a painful thing to do and it will cost, but it always leads to true freedom, no matter how painful it is. This letter then ends with a promise to all who will repent, to all who will not conform to the ways of the world, but who will live distinct lives. To those who follow Jesus with their words and the works, Jesus makes this promise. The promise is that those who are faithful, those who are victorious, will inherit two gifts. Two quite strange gifts, if we're honest. First, the promise is of hidden manna. Manna was, of course, the food that God supernaturally supplied to his people as they endured their desert pilgrimage. It was a reminder of God's daily provision for them, a means of strengthening them for the journey that lay ahead of them as they went towards the promised land. So the promise here to give manna to those who remain faithful seems to be a promise of God's provision for the journey of life and faith as we walk with him. In John chapter 6, Jesus links himself with this manna when he declares that he is the bread of life. So this imagery is tied up with the John 6 imagery of Jesus being the manna. The promise of the manna is a promise that for all who are victorious, that we will know the strengthening and the satisfaction that is found in Christ alone. That he will strengthen and sustain us for each step of the journey. He will not abandon us in the midst of cultural pressure and trials. And that's good news, isn't it? In fact, it's more than that because the promise of supernatural provision and protection is essential as we seek to follow Jesus in a world that seems to be increasingly set against him and his word and his ways. We need that supernatural strength, that supernatural food that he gives us. The second gift that the the victor will receive, we're told, is a, a white stone with a new name on it, a name known only to the one who receives it. There are many, many various interpretations about what this white stone might be. I think I counted 20 across different commentators this week. But white stones were often given as rewards in the ancient world, especially to those who competed in the games. The stone could be used to get an acquittal in a court of law. Another interpretation comes from the law courts where jurors would use black and white stones to give their verdict of whether someone was guilty or innocent. They would give black for guilty or white for innocent. So on one level, the stone might be a simple image that simply refers to the innocence, the purity, the holiness that is found to those who are victorious in Christ. But I think the the symbolism that seems to fit best with the passage here, at least in my view, is that these white stones with names on them were also at times used as tokens to get access to feasts and meals and celebrations. They were, if you like, a kind of VIP ticket. And so to those who overcome, to those who remain faithful to Jesus, an invitation to the marriage supper of the Lamb will be extended. A token to the marriage supper of the Lamb will be extended. They will one day feast with Jesus forever in his home. Today at weddings, people use all kinds of things as place settings to let people know where they should sit. In the 90s, it was just a wee white piece of card with your name on it. But now people use all kinds of things, wood and shells and even stones. They write names and stones as a place setting at the wedding. Perhaps that's the symbol of the stone here. It's our place setting at the marriage supper of the Lamb. To those who are victorious, to those who overcome They will have a place with Jesus at his table and his eternal home. That is our hope. That's why we are to have nothing to do with food that is sacrificed to idols. That's why we have nothing to do with pagan feasts here on earth. The reward is the reward for saying no to these things here and now. The reward for saying no to the things of this world now will be entry into a greater feast. And the the greatest feast that will never end. These are the rewards for those who are victorious to the end. The letter to the church in Pergamon is undoubtedly the most strange that we have encountered so far, full of interesting different little references. It's strange and obscure references to things that we are unfamiliar with can leave us at times scratching our heads. But hopefully this morning you've seen that as we peel back the layers and look at what Jesus is saying, we find a a very contemporary message. An encouragement that it is possible to hold on to the truth of the gospel even when we live in a culture that is radically opposed to it. There is a a warning here to think carefully about how we interact with the world around us and to take care that we are not conformed to it. To ensure that we submit to Jesus' authority in daily faith and repentance. 
there's also a promise. A promise that when we do endure for Jesus in the face of the challenges of the modern world, that he is with us, strengthening us and supplying us with all we need until we will one day join him in that great family feast that he has prepared for those who love and follow him now. That is our hope as we seek to follow Jesus in these difficult days. May it be our reality, we pray. In his name. Amen. Come now and bring our prayers for ourselves and other people. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we come before you now and we give thanks that you promised to be with us, to protect us and to provide for us while we journey through this life. We admit that at times the journey can feel hard and uphill. There seems to be increasing opposition and difficulty along the way. So we give thanks that you have not left us alone on this journey, but you have formed us into your people, the church. You have given us Christian friends and community to support and to encourage us along the way. At this moment, Lord, we feel the pain of separation from that community and long for the day when the situation and the circumstances will allow us to be together again in ways that are safe for us all. But until that day, Lord, we continue to look to you. Help us to continue looking out for and checking in on one another as we are able to do using the technology available to us. Help us to share our burdens and to be comfortable enough to be open and honest with each other. Help us to be constant in prayer for each other. We thank you, Lord, for the technology of different kinds and how it has allowed us to remain connected, even in these days of physical separation. We pray that as we gather to worship you in our individual homes, online and on the phone, we pray that we would know a real sense of your presence and a sense of the unity that we have in you. Father, as we are thinking today about taking a stand for Jesus in the public square, not conforming to the culture around us, we must admit that this is not easy and in fact we find it difficult. So we ask for wisdom, grace, strength and courage to hold on to the faith that was once delivered to us. We give thanks today, Lord, for organisations like the Christian Institute and the Evangelical Alliance who seek to be a voice for you in the public square, for all they do in defending your word and proclaiming it. We ask that you would bless their ministry, help them as they seek to represent your church. Give them grace as they speak truth to power. Pray for Christian leaders across all sectors of society today, but we pray especially for those in the political arena. We pray for political leaders who confess you as Lord and Saviour and ask that you would help them as they seek to be faithful witnesses to you and your word in these days. We pray that you would help them as they seek to be salt and light in the sphere of influence that you have placed them. In a time of political uncertainty, we pray that all Christians working in politics would model disagreeing well and be quick to listen, slow to speak and slow to get angry. We pray that Christian groups in each of the main parties would grow in influence and the positive contribution that they can make. Father, we pray that you would bless them in all their efforts. Father, we do come today and we Remember the continuing coronavirus situation. We give thanks for the hope of vaccination rollout. But Lord, we do continue to pray for those who struggle with illness, who mourn loss, for those who continue to work long and hard to treat those who are ill. Lord, be very near them and bless them, we pray. Lord, we pray that soon you would bring this to a swift end. That is our deepest desire as we pray now in Jesus' name. Amen.
may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. God bless and take care.